Well, hello, everyone. Uh, Welcome to the Bridge Church. Thank you for joining us for our online worship experience uh, today. Um, I am just so um, excited that you would take some time to join us and be with us together. Um, By the way, every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., this is kind of our new pattern, and so we're all going to be together online. We're going to be chatting it up in the comment section. We're going to be high-fiving. We're going to be doing emojis, all that good stuff. And so just to uh, encourage you to join us every Sunday. Um, every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. as we come together to worship um, in this way. So we are so glad that you are joining us today. Hey, it is a rare um, moment that we find ourselves in right now. I mean, it's just so bizarre on so many different levels. It's actually a rare historical moment. There aren't very many situations and moments really in the history of the world where everyone globally is impacted by the very same uh, thing. And so with this virus, I mean, the entire globe is, is on a, is a shutdown right now. It's, it's locked down. We're all facing the same threat. We're all facing the same uh, enemy. And so it's just a, it's just a crazy a moment that we find ourselves in. And, and I think that most of us are asking the question, like, how are we going to get through this? How, how are we going to get through this? Some of you are facing all sorts of different kinds of circumstances um, in your home and at your work, or maybe you're not in work, or maybe you're furloughed right now, maybe you're a business owner, maybe you are wh- whoever you are. We're all asking, I think, the same question. How are we going to get through this? How long is this thing going to last? How are we going to make it in this? And so that's, that's actually the title of our series that we just started last week, How, um, how to Get Through, How to um, Get um, through. And I'll just, I'll just want to say as we begin, the quality of your life will be measured by how you handle adverse situations. The question isn't like, will we face adverse um, situations and circumstances? The question is not, will we face adversity in life? You will face adversity. The question is then, um, the, how will you handle it? Because the quality of your life um, will be measured by how you handle Adversity. And so we as the people of God, we come together in this fashion and we have always, and this is what we have always done and this is what we always will do, we take our cues from the word, from the word of God, from the revelation of God. That's how we get through. That, that's how we make it. It, it isn't very complex. It, it, it isn't a crazy kind of formula that we've got to figure out. To, it's actually kind of simple. We take the word of God and we see what the word of God has to say for us um, in this moment and in this situation. So we're in this series called How to Get Through. Um, somebody in the chat right now say How to Get Through. Um, put, that, put that in the chat. How to Get Through. Um, how are we going to get through this? Um, This is our series, How to Get Through, and we're looking specifically at the Psalms, which is a a book in the New Testament, sorry, in the Old Testament. It's actually a collection of poems and songs that were written um, upwards of 3,000 years ago. And what's so beautiful about these Psalms is that these Psalms express literally every kind of emotion, every kind of feeling uh, about life circumstances, about the hardest things that we can face. And when we look at the Psalms, we see actual people who had to go through things, and they show us what it was like for them to go through it, and they give us a little bit of a pattern for what it is like for us to go through it. So today, we're in Psalm 34. We're in the Psalm number 34, one of my favorite Psalms in the entire book of Psalms. We're in Psalm 34, written specifically by a man named David, upwards of 3,000 years ago. Now, David, just to give you a little bit of of context, um, David is writing in Psalm 34, get this, um, about a situation that, that he just came through. David, in Psalm 34, is going to show us um, how he got through it, how he did it. And so King David, um, he's actually not the king yet when he's writing this. Um, he has been anointed by God to be the next king over God's people. But at this moment, he isn't yet the king. He's in a season of waiting. He's in kind of a season of a wilderness. And what's similar about David's situation and our situation is that David is actually facing a similar threat. It it isn't a virus, but it is a threat. It's an enemy that wants to end his life, actually coming after David, wanting to kill him. And so this is what David does. He has to flee. He has to flee the city. He has to flee the kingdom Um, for days and days and weeks and months. He's literally um, isolated. He's running uh, for for the sake of his life. He's literally hiding in tombs, uh, sorry, caves rather. Um, He's hiding away from his enemy. Um, He doesn't want to die. He's running. He's trying to figure out how to to rest during the day. He's trying to figure out how to move around, where will be actually a safe 
haven for him. He's, one, he's figuring out how to get food on his own. He's figuring out just how uh, to make it. He's, he's battling with his own um, mental life. He's got physical challenges. He's got emotional challenges. He's, he's away from all of his family. He's away from his friends and from the people that are closest uh, to him. He's facing isolation. He's facing an unbelievably um, adverse situation. And then in Psalm 34, he actually writes and he tells us, looking back on his situation, how he got through it. He's essentially saying, this is how I did it, okay? So here's the, here's the sermon for today. Here's the sermon for today. I want somebody to, if, if you're with somebody, I want you to tell uh, the, the person that you're with, your neighbor, tell them uh, what the title of the sermon um, is. Get ready to tell them what the title of the sermon is. If you're not with anyone, put it in the chat. Get ready to put this in the chat. Maybe send a text to a friend or a family member. Um, here's the title of the sermon. This is the title. Here, here we go. The title of the sermon. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. Somebody text somebody. Somebody say that to somebody. Somebody put it in the chat. And you're like, Ethan, are you um, using a 1995 reference from Montel Jordan? Yes, I am. I'm referencing the 1995 song, This Is How We Do It, which was actually uh, sampled from Slick Rick, which was then sampled from Bob James, uh, to be clear. Um, we're, we're, we're looking at this, um, this idea of this is how we do it. Now, in 1995, Montel Jordan is telling us this is how they do it in South Central L.A., which, by the way, we got some uh, production members that are on our team that are from L.A. Um, can we just, real quick, can we just uh, put it in the chat, get, do a little high five, do an emoji? Can we give a little love to our production team and our production ministry for all that they're doing with this to make this online worship experience possible? Can we give them a little love, give them a little emoji, high five or something? Um, all, all, all the people, a couple of them are actually from um, L.A., and so they love this reference uh, to death. But Montel Jordan, back in 1995, is saying, hey, this is how we do it. This is how we roll. This is our M.O. And I'm saying today that, that David is going to tell us this is how we do it, okay? As the people of God, this is how we do it. This is how we get through hard situations. This is how we get through some of life's most adverse circumstances. This is how we do it. And by the way, if this is going to be impactful for you, if this is going to be helpful for you, or maybe there's somebody else in your mind that you're thinking of, a friend, a neighbor, a family member who, who maybe needs some help for understanding how to do it as well, how to get through this, why don't you share this? Share this. Click the share button. Share this with somebody. Send it. Text it. Whatever. Send this to somebody. Let's get, let's get the word out. Let's get the message out and help people who are facing adverse circumstances, okay? So are ready for this? Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Psalm um, Psalm 34, verses 1 through 10, this is how we do it. And I know some of you are right now um, in your living room uh, dropping a beat or doing some dance moves too. This is how we do it. That's okay. We, we encourage um, a participation in worship. All right. Psalm 34, um, Psalm 34, and we'll begin in verse 1. I'll walk through verses 1 through 10 today, um, right now, and then I'll make a few um, applications. So here we go. Psalm 34, uh, beginning in verse 1. It says this. David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And just real quick, how many of you are like, that's not what I wanted to hear right now. <laughs> I mean, can we, can we just be honest? Like, we don't want some, like, nice, fluffy psalm right now about how someone is always praising God, how someone is always blessing God. But here's what we need to recognize. After, after David has experienced what he has experienced, he gets to a point in his life where he just, he's learned to bless the Lord at all times. I mean, he, he has been so moved. He's been so transformed. He's been so wrecked by God that he's like, he just begins and he's like, I just bless the Lord at all times. I'm going I'm to bless him. It doesn't matter what I face. It doesn't matter what situation I'm in. First of all, I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth all the time. I'm just going to keep praising. I'm going to praise him in the storm. I'm going to praise him in the pain. Which, by the way, some of us just need to put some praise on our lips. I know that you're facing unbelievable challenges right now. But put some praise on your lips. Put some praise in your heart. All right, let's, let's be people of praise even in the hardest moments. In verse 2, verse 2 he says, My soul, which means the inner essence and will and heart of who he is, he says, My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Like, he, he's learned. I... I ain't boasting in myself anymore, all right? I, I, I've done been wrecked. I've gone through some hard stuff. No longer am, am I trying to boast in David and boast in me. I, I've learned I'm going to boast in the Lord in this. And he says, let the humble hear and be glad. Let the humble hear. This is a psalm. This kind of shows us this is for the humble. 
This is for the humble. Let the humble hear and be glad, which means the only kind of person that's actually going to be able to receive this and implement it in their life is the humble person. Verse 3, he says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Magnify the Lord, which means make him big, make him known, make his glory known. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Which, by the way, um, what are you magnifying right now in your life? All of us are magnifying something. You're magnifying a disease right now. You're magnifying a virus. You're magnifying a lack of this or a lack of this or a lack. What what are we magnifying in this season? This isn't in my notes, but let's magnify the Lord right now. Let's magnify the Lord. What you you magnify is what your heart is going to be um, um, really engulfed with and enraptured with. So let's magnify the Lord. Then verse 4, all right? So this is, that was his little intro. That was his little preamble. And now in verse 4, he's actually going to show us verses 4 through 7. This is how we do it, all right? This is how we do it, verse 4. He says in his challenging situation, looking back, he says, I sought the Lord. I sought the Lord. That word there, we're going to dig into that. It, it means, it means to, to seek. It means to really go after it. I sought the Lord and he, God, he answered me. He answered me in the middle of my situation, in the middle of my pain, God answered me and he delivered me from all of my fears. He delivered me. He set me free from all of my fears. This word here for fear, you're going to see this word later in verses uh, 9 uh, and verse um, 11, I think, later in the psalm, it's actually a different word in the original Hebrew than the words you'll find later. This word for fear, it means terrors. It means terrors. I mean, it just, you have children that have um, night terrors that wake up in the middle of the night and they're screaming and uh, they're yelling or they're completely confused, they're completely disoriented. David says that he, he had terrors during the day. I mean, he, his whole life was just plagued with, with terrors. I mean, with the reality that he might die with the reality of his pain and his situation. He said God delivered him from his, all his fears, all his terrors. Verse 5, he says, those who look to him, those who look to God are radiant. They're radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. He says in verse 6, this poor man, talking about himself, this poor man, identifying himself, identifying his current posture, This poor man cried. I'm talking like ugly crying. I mean, this word for crying, it's like, it's like really, like really crying, really going at ugly tears. I mean, boo-hoo crying. Some of you have been crying in this season. That's okay. It's okay to do that. It's okay for all of us, uh, women and men, everybody. We need to be crying in this season. We need to be taking our reality to God and actually be um, externalizing these internal emotions. He says, I cried. I just bawled before the Lord. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. God heard his cry. God was near to him. It says, and saved him out of all his troubles. Saved him out of all his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. That's the word for all. Not the same word as earlier as terrors, but this is the word for all. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who have reverence, who have all for him, and he delivers them. Could it be any more clear? And then verse 8, he says, after he's recounted his previous situation and how he did it, how he got through it, verse 8, he says, Oh, taste and see, which is his encouragement to you today. It's his encouragement to me today. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You you see that like... um, the language that he's using, very sensory language, tangible language. He's saying, I have been so close to God. I've experienced God in such a way where I feel like I've even tasted him and even seen him. And I've been so close to God through the hardest situations in my life where I feel like I even have tasted him and touched him and know what he is like. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, which is his heart for you today. Taste and see that the Lord is good, even right now in this moment. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him, who hides himself, hides herself in God. Verse 9, oh, fear the Lord. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, which means that's the same word for awe and reverence. For those who fear him have no lack. They lack nothing. They have everything that they need. It's like Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not lack anything for those who fear the Lord. Verse 10, The young lions, they suffer want, 
and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Those who seek, it's the same word as verse 4 and sought. Those who seek the Lord, they lack no good thing. Which, by the way, guys, I'm going to need my uh, towel because I'm preaching today, okay? I'm preaching. I'm sweating up here. So if somebody could give me a little love and grab me my, my towel. Um, you, know what they, you know what they say in some churches? Um, you are, you're not um, preaching unless you're sweating, and I'm already sweating today. So they're going to grab me my towel, okay? So here, here's, here's where we're at. I think there are two postures um, for how we face life's hardest circumstances. I think two postures for the way the average person, um, two, two ways the average person faces life's hardest um, circumstances, and these are, um, these are the two ways, okay? Thanks, brother. Amen. Got to wipe the sweat off of the head. You know you're preaching when you're sweating. Here are the two ways, all right? The first way is what I will call the DIY way, the DIY, which stands for do it yourself. You face life's hard circumstances, hard challenges. You're, you're, in a, you're in a really hard season. This is the first posture. It is the DIY do-it-yourself um, remedy, it's, which is I can do this on my own. I got this thing. I can do this on my own. Or, or it's I can handle this on my own. You ever said that? I can get myself through this. I don't need help. I'm strong enough to get through this. This, this is kind of the, the first response. Um, which is the response of DIY, do it yourself. Now, I would say that's the average, um, that's the most natural, I would say that's the most common way that most of us, um, really all humans, face life's circumstances is that we can get ourselves through this. We got it. We got the strength. We got the, we got the knowledge. We got the resources. If, I'm just, if I could just be smart enough, if I could just be strong enough, if I could pick myself up by my own two bootstraps, then I can get myself through this. That's the first posture is the do-it-yourself. Now, here's the second posture, and this is the posture that we see of David in this psalm, and it's the posture of surrender. The posture of surrender. And we need to hear today that this is a good thing. The posture of surrender is this. I can't do this on my own. I can't do it on my own. I can't handle this on my own. I can't get myself through this. I need help. When's the last time that you said that? When's the last time that you recognized and that you owned and that you admitted that you can't do this on your own, that you can't get yourself through this thing, that you actually need help? This is the posture of, I'm not strong enough to get through this on my own. I need help. I need something outside myself to help me get through this um, situation and through this um, circumstance. I think most Americans, and I would even argue today that, that the average Christian lives a life um, devoid of the presence and the power of God. I, I think the average American, I think, I think the average Christian even, they walk through life and, you know, they kind of do their thing and they, they go, go to work and they, you know, try to, try to raise their kids right and they got the degree and they're trying to pay their bills and they're just living their life and um, they'll show up, show up on Sunday, you know, get a, get a good sermon, you know, need to hear something, need a little pick-me-up, maybe thumb through the Bible occasionally, may, maybe do a little something like this, um, but church is kind of over here, God is kind of over here, I'm going to live my life and, you know, in, I might reach out to God, you know, just, just in case um, I need him. Most of us, I think, we live our lives, just even before this pandemic, um, just devoid of the presence of God in our lives and the power of God in our lives because we think that we're fine on our own. We think that we've got it. We think that we can make it. We think that we can just play our cards right and make sure that we try to live right and make sure that we try to do things um, right and we will be fine and we will get ourselves through it. But David says that's not how it works. That's actually not what you were designed for. That's not how you make it. That's not how you get through life. That's not how you get through some of life's hardest circumstances. Look with me in verse 4. Let's break it down. He says this, verse 4, I sought the Lord. I sought the Lord. This word here in the original Hebrew, it means to seek. It means to seek after something. It actually can be translated as to resort to which means I was heading one direction, I was doing something, I was, I was trying to figure out something in, in this way, and then I resorted and I began to seek a different route, a different option. It can also be translated as to consult. It can be translated as to diligently inquire of something. It can be translated as to um, 
um, to examine um, something, this word sought, it literally means to resort to. It's, it's kind of like this. Um, any of you ever tried to um, remodel something in your house? Any, anybody ever tried to? If you've tried to remodel something or build something or work on something um, at your house, put, put it in the chat. Put it in the chat, whatever you've tried to work on. Maybe it's a bathroom. Maybe it's a kitchen. Maybe you tried to build a back, whatever it is. Um, and and here's, here's, what, here's what often happens. Uh, many of us try to do things on our own, like remodel a kitchen you try to flip a kitchen or something like that, maybe even try to flip a house, but let's just say you tried to remodel a kitchen and you get about halfway through that job and you're like, why in the world did I ever think this was a good idea? Like you're trying to figure out how to saw and how to cut tile and put tile on the backsplash behind um, your kitchen counter. And at some moment you're like, this was a bad idea. At some point in the project, you're like, I can't do this. At some point, you're like, I don't actually know how to do this. You were trying to do it yourself, and then you resorted to another option. You picked up the phone. You Googled a contractor. You called a contractor and said, can, can you come please help me? How many of you are contractors, and you've showed, you, part of your work or much of your work is actually fixing problems that um, homeowners created? Like you're showing up and you're fixing things that they tried to do that they found out that they weren't able to do on their own. And then they finally called you. This is what this word seek means. It means I was trying to, to do something on my own. Then, then I'm resorting to another option. I'm seeking another option. And David says, I sought the Lord. David says, I, I, I was trying to do it on my own. I was trying to fight it on my own. I was trying to get myself through this. And I got to a point where I realized I can't do this on my own. I don't have what it takes. I wasn't made to do this on my own. And so he says he shifts. He says, I sought the Lord. I sought the Lord. I went after him. I recognized in my situation that I did not have what it takes to get myself through this. And I sought the Lord. This is the position of surrender. This is the position of surrender. I would like to make the case today that this idea of seeking, if you were to look through the Bible, if you were to look through the entire Bible, I did kind of a short study this week on seeking um, in the Bible. I would make the case that much of what God desires from you and from me is just for us to seek him. I would make the case that if you could boil down much of what the Bible expects from you and me, I would say much of it is just to seek him, just to go after him, to pursue him, to want him, to need him, to demonstrate that you actually need him and want to be in a relationship with him. Here's a a few verses I I have that that I'll share with you. through several scriptures. So let's start with this one. Psalm 14, 2. Psalm 14, 2 says this. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. Do you see that? You you get that picture? The psalmist has given us a picture of God. God is is in heaven. He's He's looking down from heaven on the children of man, and he's just looking to see if there are any who seek after him. God is quite literally looking from heaven to his creation, just wondering if anybody is going to seek after him. Like, God is the creator of the the universe. He made you and me. We have our very existence because of God. And God's just like, would you seek me? Like, can we have a relationship together? Like, do you even need me at all? I, I made you for myself. I didn't make you for a career. I didn't make you for anything else. I didn't make you for something in the world. I made you for me. The psalmist says that God is actually looking and he's seeking those who are actually going to seek him. Ezekiel 34, the prophet in the Old Testament, he says this, Ezekiel 34, verse 11 through 16. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I, I myself will search. That's the same word for seek or sought. I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. And he gives us a little analogy. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep. And I will bring them out of the peoples and gather them from the the countries and will bring them into their own land. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. That's the kind of relationship that God wants with us. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. 
This is, this is the heart of God. This is the essence of God. God is actually in pursuit of you. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what your age is. I don't care what your status is. I don't care what your race is. God is seeking you. God is pursuing you. That's what he does for his humanity. He wants you. He wants to know you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He is actually in pursuit of you. And this is what the Lord says. Look in Amos 5, verse 4. Amos 5, verse 4. It says this. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, to his people, seek me and live. Which, that's pretty simple, right? Seek me. In this particular passage, it's not a list of commandments. It's not a list of some kind of ordinances. Just seek me. Seek me. And then the benefit or what will happen if you do that is live. That's how you live. That's how you'll have the kind of life that you want to have. Seek me and live. Hosea 10, 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground for it is time. It is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and rain righteousness upon you which kind of has the idea that if we would seek the Lord, he would come and rain righteousness on us. Deuteronomy, another passage, Deuteronomy 4.29 says this, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. Seek the Lord, you'll find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. If you actually need him and want him and desire him, seek for him with all that you have. And then lastly, Jeremiah 29.13 It says this, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord. You'll seek me. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me, when you pursue me with all of your heart. And I will be found by you, declares um, the Lord. Two ways to live. Two ways to live. Two ways to face hard circumstances. Two ways to face life's greatest challenges and difficulties. First is do it yourself. You can do this. You got the strength. You can handle it. You can get through this. Do it yourself or a surrender. Surrender. Surrender to God. Surrender to him. Surrender your situation to him. Surrender, it's a white flag. It's kind of a white flag in your life. I'm done. I'm done. I don't actually have what it takes. I, I, I'm going to stop pursuing other things. I'm going to start search, stop searching after other things. I'm going to seek out God. I'm going to search out God. I'm going to find God. I'm going to pursue him. I'm going to desire him. I'm going to go after him. Surrender. Surrender to him. And here's the promise that we find in the scriptures, in these scriptures that we just read, is that if you do it yourself, um, you're essentially saying you're putting yourself at arm's length away from God. God, I don't really need you, okay? I got this. I'm okay, I don't really need you in my life, don't really need you in that kind of way, not even sure if I really believe in you in that way, I just get, you know what, you just, I believe that you're out there, but you know, I'll just keep you, at all. I got this, I, I can get myself through this, do it yourself or um, surrender. So when you put your arms linked at, at God, he actually does the same to you. Um, 1 Peter 5, 5 says this, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud, but he gives, like word gives, it's kind of like a financial word. He, he credits, he deposits grace to the humble. Here, here's the truth. You live your life at arm's length away from God, God will resist you. But if you pursue the Lord, if you seek the Lord, if you go after him, he will actually credit to you. He will give to you grace. When you come to God and you say, I need you. When you come to God and say, I can't do this on my own, God actually, that's when God responds. That's when actually God gives. That's that's when God gives to us. That's when he blesses us. That's when the text says he delivers us from all of our troubles. He, He saves us. This is the promise. This is the way that we were designed to live, is to seek after God, to seek after him. And then we receive everything that we need from God. And those who seek him, they have no lack. See what God gives See what God gives us whenever we surrender to him? I'll I'll say it this way. Surrender is the currency of the kingdom of God. Surrender, Surrender is the currency of the kingdom of God, to use that language. In the economy of God, in the way that God works, in the way that God transacts his grace, the way that God responds 
to us, the currency of the kingdom is not status, is not wealth, is not race, is not morality, is not rules, is not law. The currency of God's kingdom is surrender. It's surrendering to him. It's seeking out him. It's desiring him and coming to him and asking him to show up in your life. Surrender is the currency of the kingdom of God, not any of those other things. So here's what I want to do. I want to get real practical with you. We'll get real practical as, as, as some of you are like, what in the world does surrender mean? What in the world does seek mean? How in the world do you seek God? What does this look like, Ethan? I got kids running around the house. I am going crazy. Maybe you're on the front lines. You're a worker um, in, in a hospital or the government or something like that. Like, I don't know how to do this, Ethan. My life is crazy right now. Like, what, what in the world should I do? Well, here's what I want to do. Give it real, real practical. We'll end with this. Real practical. Um, write this down. If you got a journal, I know that all of you have a journal right now in front of you. You are ferociously taking notes right now um, from my sermon, and I appreciate that. I'm glad that everyone is doing that. Um, three things, um, three ways to seek God that I want to help you with from the text real, really practically as, as we close today. Here we go. Number one. Number one. The way that you seek God, number one, is the posture of surrender. The posture of surrender. Just, just, ask, our, just ask yourself, am, am I surrendered right now? Do I have a posture is the way that I'm living my life right now, is, is it postured in a place of surrender to God? Or, or, or is it kind of, I can do it myself. I can go, I can schedule, I, I, I can strategize my, my way out of this. I can resource my way out of this. I, I can figure it out. I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. If I just do, if I just do, if I just do, I can do this. What's your posture? Is it, number one, is it a posture of surrender? Is it a posture of surrender where, where like David in verse six, he says, this poor man, this poor man, he cried to the Lord. Like, do you consider yourself right now poor in this situation where you don't have what it takes to get yourself through it? By the way, um, in all of life, all of life, you don't have what it takes to get yourself through it. You were designed for God. You were designed to make it with God. You, you were designed to live a life in, in relationship with God, in connection with him, in surrender to him so that he could provide, so that he could blow, so that he could move, so that he could operate, so that he could act on your behalf. That's what you were designed to do. Do you, do you have a posture of surrender today, number one? Number two, not just a posture of surrender, but number two, the prayer of honesty. The prayer of honesty. This is lament. This is what Pastor Chris touched on last week. This is, this is what all, almost so many of the Psalms are about. It's, it's a prayer of honesty. He says that he cried. Are you, are you, are you praying? Are, are you articulating words to God? Are, are you are you praying before the Lord at all during the season? Are you telling him how you feel? I want you to know that um, when we look at the Psalms and we look at the scriptures, we actually see a pattern where the people of God actually tell God how they feel. They share with God how they feel. You know, that's actually, the, that's actually a meaningful relationship. If you're in a relationship with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or with a spouse and they never actually tell you how they feel, you never get on the inside of them, it's actually a weak relationship. But if the person shares what's on the inside, they verbalize what's on the inside, they, they articulate what's on the inside, if they, if they bring it out, if, if they share with that, then the relationship then, then can be healthy and can be strong. He says, I cried out to the Lord. I cried out to um, the Lord. It's actually the language of like screaming to God, screaming at God. In, in the Old Testament, there was this pattern um, that was called sackcloth and ashes. If you're in a season of grief, if you're in the season of loss, you would actually go out into a field. You would grab ashes from the fire from the night before. You would take sackcloth, like burlap sack. You would put it on. You would tear it. You would put it on as your clothes. You would take ashes and you would put them on your head. And you would just go out in the middle of a field and yell, yell rather, yell to the top of your lungs. That's what, that's what lament is. It's just crying out, out to God. Like, are we crying out to God in the season? Are, are, we, are we screaming out to God? I, I promise you, God would rather you scream to him than to be silent to him. God would rather you scream to him than to be silent to him. God's not afraid of your screaming. God's not afraid of your crying. God's not upset by that. He actually receives that, and he wants that, and he desires that. The prayer of honesty. You being honest to God with your prayers. Number one, the posture of surrender. Number two, the prayer of honesty. And then number three, the pursuit of presence. Number three, the pursuit of presence. Verse five, David says, those who look to him, 
are radiant. Those who look to him. What are you looking at in this season? Are you spending time to be with God, dwelling with him, finding him, setting your affection towards him, wanting to be with him, in relationship with him? He'll meet you where you are. The posture of surrender, the prayer of honesty, and then the pursuit of presence. Let me just end with this. Each of us have one of these devices. I actually mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Each of us have one of these devices that are fairly amazing with the ability and things that they are able to do, communicate to people, social media, email. Our lives seem to be um, so surrounded by these little um, devices. Um, What's amazing to me is if you know anything about the GPS technology that operates in the world, um, every single one of these devices has a GPS, which means at any moment, even if you don't have cellular data, by the way, um, they can actually locate you. You can actually locate yourself um, on a map and will pinpoint your exact um, location. How does that happen? Uh, the way that that works is back a couple decades ago, the government invested billions and billions and billions of dollars of upwards of, I believe, initially 24 satellites that are up in space that are constantly circling and surrounding the earth. It's a network of satellites. And then as well, I believe initially it was five locations um, around the world, physical locations on the ground that were also a part of sending out signals and communicating to those satellites. The way that the GPS technology works is... Um, that at any given moment, you can narrow and pinpoint your location because of a greater network of satellites that are co consistently surrounding the globe and surrounding the earth that are sending information to you. You know, this, this phone has zero capability to actually locate yourself without the ability of the satellites and the other technology. I would say in the same way, you and I, apart from the great power of God and the resources of God to say the network, the, the power of God are at, absolutely incapable of making it through this life that we find ourselves in. Today, wherever you are today, wherever you find yourself, however you make it here today, I just want to say to you today, God is seeking you. God is after you. And the, the way, the greatest way that we know that he's seeking you and pursuing us is through Jesus Christ, his son. Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, came for you on your behalf, lived the life that you couldn't live, died the death that you should have died, conquered the grave that you could not conquer. God came for you. He came for you. He lived the life of perfection, satisfying the moral requirement of God on your behalf. And then he went to the cross, taking on your sin and your shame and your pain and your guilt. And then rose from the dead, as we celebrated just a few days ago, conquering Satan, sin, hell, and the grave. And God has done everything necessary to pursue you and to seek after you. Today will you seek him. Would you pray with me? God, today we are grateful for the way that you seek us, the way that you desire us. And God, I just ask that you would help us to pursue you and long for you and seek after you and surrender our lives um, to you. Hey, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed today, Without, if you're with other people, without looking around, just take a moment um, between you and God. Is your life surrendered to God today? Have you ever come to a point in your life where you've surrendered your life to God? Not, not joined a church, not been a member of a church, not even been baptized, not, not, any, not any of those things. But have you ever surrendered your life to God? That's what salvation is. That's how salvation works. That's how God designed it to be. Today, if you want to surrender your life to God, I would encourage you to, to do something like this. Through a prayer of faith, say, God, today, I surrender my life to you. God, I surrender my life to you. I trust in you. I trust in Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection for me. And I believe that you are making me new. In Jesus' name. Hey, well, if you took that step today to surrender your life to Christ, we want to know. We want to help. Um, there's a link that's going to be coming uh, right across your screen right now that's a way to get connected, a way to take a next step. Please let us know. Let us know. We'd love to be able to follow up with you, help you. Is this a huge moment that you are taking this step to um, follow God and to trust in him?